This is the Better Life Podcast with Brandon Turner. Cameron Cathcart. That was a very low energy and intro. And Cameron there Cathcart. There we go. Much better. Cam, dude, uh, last night hanging out with our families up on the side of a mountain with a bunch of podcast guests. How cool was that? Dude, life couldn't be better. It was life amazing. couldn't be better. It's so sunset. We had, yeah, we had drone crashes. Drone crashes, which we'll talk about in the show. We, yeah, it was, a, it was a lot of fun. We had s'mores. We had, no, we had uh, smrownies. Did you get the smrownie? I did not get oh, a smrownie. Oh, dude. I haven't made a video about it. This was the single greatest idea I've ever had in my entire life. So Megan's mom brought brownies, homemade brownies, mm -hmm. and my family brought s'mores because my kids wanted s'mores. So when you combine them together, so here's what you do. It was a big marshmallows. Uh-huh. You roast the big marshmallow, but you roast it a little bit quickly, so the outside gets toasty brown, but the inside's still a little bit cold. So when you pull it off the stick, the outside or the inside of the marshmallow comes out. Now you got a hollow roasted marshmallow. You shove the brownie in the marshmallow, then you put it between the gram. It was the single greatest tasting item of food I have ever had in my entire life. That sounds Smrownie. incredible. Dude, I'm, I'm so good. disappointed nobody came yeah, to me. Yeah, nobody got like, a Cameron, do you yeah. want a Smrownie? No, even Lexi had some. Lexi had yeah. a Smrownie yeah. and didn't tell me? <laughs> yeah, she oh, did. my goodness. <laughs> Dude, I, yeah. We were sitting around <laughs> all just off. amazed we, at how great it was. We were supposed uh, to have date night tonight, and that's yeah, not happening. Yeah, now you to cancel anymore. that on her, because you could go make Smrownies tonight. For myself, <laughs> and leave her at home. <laughs> all right, man. Today's episode uh, with Ben Reinberg. He is a commercial real estate investor. And that is putting it lightly. The guy has mm. bought and managed and owns and billions of dollars of real estate. He's one of the most prolific commercial real estate investors I've ever met. Uh, the guy's a complete rock star, but humble as they come. I mean, the dude is just uh, just a rock star. So we cover a ton of things today. Yeah. Like uh, we talk about how we got into commercial real estate at a super young age. I mean, we talk about how anybody can get into real estate at a young age. Uh, we talk about parenting. Mm -hmm. We talk about... Uh, just the, the struggles of building a real estate empire, but then also how to get through those struggles. Yeah. I think my favorite part was, and I don't want to ruin it, but was just, you know, when seemingly he's on top of the world, you know, in his forties and yeah. feeling unfulfilled and yeah. how he, how he changed that and has changed his company because yeah. of that. And his advice to you on like sleeping better. Yeah. Uh, that was Slowing down. Yeah, slowing down. Phenomenal. I loved it. So I, good. I could have I could have sat here all day and just hung out and talked with him. Let's get into today's show with Mr. The Real Ben Reinberg. Ben Reinberg, welcome to the show, man. Thank you guys. I appreciate being here. Dude, how's the leg? <laughs> <laughs> the leg is great. I'm okay. okay. I'm living. Okay, good. The I'm story living. there. I'm glad I'm in good shape. Yeah, you you survived uh, a wound from Alex Felice. So he was driving his drone last night up uh on the side of the mountain and nailed you good. Yeah, I was having a conversation <laughs> with one of your colleagues. Yeah. And next thing I know, I feel this sharp pain in my <laughs> shin, my left shin, and uh, looked at it this morning, a few cuts and bruises, yeah. but I'm Oof. okay. Uh, all right, I'm well, okay. I'm glad you're you're strong. I apologize for Alex. He's a terrible human being. So. If, if life didn't train me to be tough and have <laughs> thick skin, mm -hmm. you know, I might have had tears. Yeah. But last mm -hmm. night, they, I remember a couple of your colleagues looked at me and said, are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> I was hurting oh. inside, but I'm There we go. Good. Well, dude, I appreciate you coming out, out here to Maui. So I know you, I, I've been following you on online for a while now. You, you kill it on social media. I know you as a commercial real estate investor, broker. Uh, I know you are a, what I call a futurist and a visionary. Like I, I think you are phenomenal looking forward, a philanthropist, um, biohacker. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and just an all around like good dude. Like I, when I follow you online, I'm just like, this is a good dude I want to get to know, which is why you're here on the podcast. So Thank you. Appreciate that. Take us back before all that though. Sure. Who was Ben Reinberg before all that? Well, Ben Reinberg's always been a kid who loves candies. <laughs> okay. Candy. And Love. people that follow me online know that. I, When I was a kid, I the goal for me was to get a Slurpee. Mm. I loved 7-Eleven Slurpees. My fa then, in Chicago, my father used to play 16-inch softball. If people don't know it, is you know play with is. your hands. In Chicago, we have different types of softball. It's called a clincher, and it you break fingers, and you pitch <laughs> it underhand with arc. And it's a big game in Chicago. And so my father used to play on Sundays, and the goal was to get a Slurpee and watch them. And, and so I loved sugar as a kid. And so what that led me into was how do I be able to fund my own Slurpees <laughs> and, and candies? Because I'm a big Snickers, and yeah. uh, now with Sour Patch Kids and all that, I love chewy candies too. And so when I was eight years old, I grew up next to a town called Highwood, Illinois. It mm -hmm. had the most bars 
per square capita in the United States wow. when yeah. I was a kid growing up in the 70s. And in 1978, I was eight years old. And I realized in the bars you were able to walk in and see, and I'd see a lot of men and women smoking cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And that's how it was. And so you'd see a cloud of smoke and walk in. And I saw a cigarette machine, and they were charging about a buck fifty a pack, and you pull the handle and the cigarette would pack would come out. And Marlboro Reds and Marlboro Lights were big back then. And so back then we had uh, mom and pop uh convenience stores as well as drug stores. Mm -hmm. And there was one on the corner in Highwood, and it was called Legler's. And I, I remember I gave a Mexican, there was a lot of elite, uh, immigrants, and so I gave him a few bucks to buy me a carton of Marlboro Reds. Now, in school at the time, I was learning, uh, was it, uh, longhand uh, calculations yeah. with math. <laughs> I was just learning, I was intrigued. I always loved math. Mm -hmm. And I could do math in my head and uh, as a kid. And so... And I loved money and the power of what it allowed me to do, especially mm -hmm. to get Slurpees and candy. And so what I did was I gave him a few bucks. He went and bought a carton. I did the math and realized if I buy a carton of cigarettes, I break it up and sell it at the bar, I can outperform the cigarette machine. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to take this in context. I'm eight years old. The bars are all owned by the mafia in Chicago. <laughs> I didn't know this, obviously. I'm eight years old. All I, all I care about is... Getting uh, my sugar fix. Yeah, your candy money. That's right, my candy money. And so what ends up happening is I did for six months. I had a lot of cash. Uh, I remember one day my mom, she pulled up my mattress. I had older brothers. I wasn't going to keep it in a piggy bank or a yeah, drawer yeah. if someone might get it. So I figured smart thing is put under the mattress. Yeah. That's all it was. That was my bank. So I had ones and fives and a lot of cash. And my mom was making my bed and changing the sheets, and she lifted up. She goes, where are you getting this money from? And so I had to explain the story. It was a six-month business, great business, did really well. <laughs> but what that did was it taught me what entrepreneurship was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It taught me about the value of money. It taught me that I can make money to do what I want to do in life. And that mm -hmm. kind of propelled me every stage. I always had low business, side businesses, whether mowing lawns, snow plowing, being from yeah. Chicago. And... The work <clears throat> ethic, it's one thing I loved about Chicago, where I'm from, is the work ethic they teach and the grinding mm -hmm. is second to none. Did your parents teach you like entrepreneurship? Did you see that in your mom or your dad? Or was no, that just something where you came up with yourself? That's so ironic. So my father worked for the railroad. Uh -huh. He was a blue suit, red tie guy taking the train downtown. And my mother was a office manager for a very prestigious architectural firm that worked with Michael Jordan and all these mm -hmm. great Chicago celebrities. And they weren't entrepreneurial. They were more paycheck to paycheck. And I would saw, see my dad, and he would always complain about mergers, and he's going to lose his job. And what I learned was I don't want to be that guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I respect it. I respect anyone that gets a paycheck and works hard and can raise a family. I think it's wonderful. But I, I was different. I was a rebel as a kid, mm -hmm. Cam. And... I looked at life differently. I said, I don't want to live a normal life. I don't want to be the guy who puts on a suit. And so when I graduated from Indiana University, I was in accounting at Indiana, which was one of the best accounting programs in, in the country at mm -hmm. the time. And it was a top five business school, the Indiana University, uh, University Business School. And so what it was interesting was I was on an audit with a billionaire in New York City. It was the first time I've ever been to New York, and I was in Manhattan. I'm in a suit, and I'm there for two and a half weeks. Mm -hmm. And I'm spending time with him, eating dinner. You know, he's helping me with the audit and other people on the audit. And he pulls me aside, and he goes, when are you going to get out of accounting? <laughs> he knew I was an entrepreneur. Yeah. I said, what are you talking about? Now, this guy started cable around the <laughs> country. Wow. Okay, huge player. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, you're not much of an accountant. Now, for me, at the age of 22 years old, that's an ego blow. Because I'm like, you know, I'm just starting this job. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is the first audit I'm yeah, on. Yeah, and you're telling me I'm not good and, enough. And I'm not good enough. <laughs> and, and he pulled me aside. He goes, I, and he, he looked. I was a little down. He's like, that's, you don't understand what I mean. He goes, you're more of an entrepreneur. You should be owning your own business. You shouldn't be working in accounting. They should be working for you. I took a step back, and it, and it had a tremendous impact. I never forgot that moment. I went back, 
I talked to a gentleman out of Los Angeles who was big in real estate. We were working on his taxes, and I said, I said, I need to get into a wealth building business. So I went back home. That I was living at my parents before I moved downtown Chicago, which was always the goal when you're mm-hmm. in your 20s. And I was watching an infomercial, and it was Robert Kiyosaki and Sharon mm-hmm. Lecter's uh, book, Rich, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I watched it, and I watched that infomercial probably 10 times in a row. It just mm-hmm. kept looping and looping. I bought the book. Now, remember, you can't download an e-book these days in the 90s, early 90s. I order the book. It comes two weeks later. I read the book twice within a 24-hour period, and I said, this is what I want to do, and this is who I'm going to be. I'm going to buy assets that produce cash flow, and I'm going to be the best at it. And so with the financial mind I had and being a CPA, most people don't realize I'm also a CPA. I had no idea. And, and most people don't because I don't really advertise mm-hmm. it. You know, p- people think they're stiff and dorky and, and <laughs> boring, but I'm not your typical CPA. And so I used it, and I left the firm, and I started my company, Alliance. And what's interesting is most people get into brokerage. I've never been a broker in the business. Mm-hmm. I've always been a principal. And for everyone out there that doesn't know what that yeah, means, say, especially because yeah. you follow Brandon, you know how mm-hmm. successful he is, it's I'm an owner, a mm-hmm. landlord. That's what a principal is. A principal is the main guy in the transaction. He's not mm-hmm. brokering the deal. He's not shuffling paper. I'm going to own the it. asset and mm-hmm. buy the asset. And so and my company is. And so I started that immediately. And we did our first deal. I syndicated an industrial building in the Chicago area. It was great. I Your was, first deal. My first deal. <laughs> it's 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 about a hundred thousand square foot industrial building. Okay, and it's millions of dollars. And I am young. I'm 23 yeah. years old. So 23. You didn't start with like a house or a no. That's insane. I went. I went because for me, <laughs> what am I doing with my uh, life? For me, well, for me, what I realized in Chicago has a weird housing market. Mm-hmm. It's it's ebbs and flows. Or certain pockets are good. Residential real estate is always school driven. Mm-hmm. Better yeah. schools are where the real estate residential markets thrive. And I learned that at a young age. And I realized, okay, if I buy a house for 150000 I sell it for maybe one hundred seventy-five, two hundred thousand. 200000 put all this work in, all this risk. I didn't see the numbers. I like bigger numbers, mm-hmm. Cam. Yeah. And so Chicago has a huge industrial market, big office market. Mm-hmm. And the biggest icons in the country at that time were in commercial real estate, the Crown family, the Pritzkers, Sam Zell. I mean, there's hundreds in Chicago mm-hmm. ar- that are around the world investing in commercial real estate. So I would look at these people. I'm like, I want to be that guy. I want to be that family. I want to have that brand. Mm-hmm. So I put this deal under contract, and I go to my godfather, Bruno Bertucci, uh, God rest his soul. He passed away years ago. And he sat on the board of a local bank because mm-hmm. I didn't know I'd get financing that yeah. that moment. I, didn't, I had to learn how to put together a deal. Mm-hmm. I knew the numbers. So I put together a great package. Bruno walked me in the bank, got me a loan. I signed personally because for me at that time, guys, what I have to lose, yeah, yeah. right? Yep. What is Ben Reinberg signing? Yeah. When he's signing a piece of paper, and he's like a ghost yeah. when it comes to personal wealth right now, his, his net worth. And so I walked in, and I gave a presentation in the bank, and he looked at me, winked at me. He's like, that was perfect, and he got me the loan. He went to committee, and they got me the loan. So I closed. First week, I lose 45% of the income in the building. Oh, jeez. Oh, no. I backfill it <clears throat> from a 210 industrial to a 310 industrial. I sold it three years later for a 3X multiple. Oh, oh my God. And that's what launched me. But it was interesting because there were so many details in that deal that taught me so many great lessons of uh, transparency. Mm-hmm. You know, I walked into, I was buying the deal from two icon national home builders that were also in commercial real estate that own huge home building companies. They were worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And they taught me something. They taught me resilience. They taught me how to be focused and present and everything. The first time I met them, they brought me in a conference room. And the conference room was about the size of this office. Mm-hmm. And they had this huge table. And it was the winter, and they turned up the heat on me. And I was in a suit and tie and sweating. 
lady comes in with the fine china and asks, hey, would you like a Mr. Reinberg a cup of coffee? And I was really young. And these two guys sit at the end of the table, and they looked at me and put their hand down. They said, so, young man, why are we selling you this asset? It's, where do you have millions of dollars? Have you ever done a deal? It's like drilling me. Mm -hmm. And I just sat there and kept my mouth shut and listened. And I said, um, they said, are, are you going to close? I said, here's my term sheet. I said, I have 80% of the equity raised, and I'll be ready in two weeks. I said, by the way, we have a challenge we have to deal with. And they said, what? And I, I gave them a list of the credits I mm -hmm. wanted along with all the quotes. And they said, you have a lot of nerve coming in here asking for money from mm -hmm. us. I said, look, you have a roof that needs to be replaced. You have a parking lot that's in shambles. And I started itemizing. I said, and I have three quotes for each. I walked out of there with a $300,000 credit, mm -hmm. <laughs> closed a few weeks later. That's wild. And that's what started my career. So how did you as a 23-year-old, how much did you have to raise for this? I raised probably about... A million eight. A million eight. How yeah. did you as a 23-year-old have the connections or just have the, the capabilities to raise that much money? Kim, it's a phenomenal question because I look back and I said, how did I do that? <laughs> and, and a lot of it was shoe leather. Uh -huh. So there was no internet at the time. It yeah. was just coming online. And it was phone and setting up meetings and asking for referrals. And so every meeting, suit and tie, you know, my men's warehouse or sim suit with the polished shoes, nice tie, walk in, we'd sit down. I would show you the numbers. I was paying a great return. I gave away most of the store in equity. Mm -hmm. And it was a property in one of the best suburbs in the United States because it was 20 minutes from O'Hare Airport. There was a brand new development called the Glen that was coming on board. It was, they took a Navy base and made it residential, retail, office, industrial, and in one area, and it was just going to be spectacular. So I had all these captains of industry that own businesses that, God forbid, I have a vacancy in this property I could draw from. Mm -hmm. And so I told the story, and I created a story, I showed the numbers, and I built trust and yeah. rapport. And because I was polished and I understood the numbers and I memorized the story I was learning about how to sell people naturally over through the process. And I would gauge myself what worked, what didn't work. And I grinded. I grinded 24-7, Sunday, Saturday. Whatever I had to do, I did it to raise that money. And it was a lot of mindset. I was not walking away from that deal, not raising yeah. that mm -hmm. money. I told myself, I said, Ben, you have to raise this money. You busted your butt getting the loan from Bruno. Yeah. Now it's time you got to shine. And so, and I carried that with me through my career. Mm -hmm. I, I love a challenge. I love when people say, so Cam, one of the things that I love is when I hear people say can't, won't, yeah. shouldn't, wouldn't, because my mindset's, I'm like, I can't, I can't even absorb that, that statement, yeah. that word, because I don't believe in the word can't. I don't believe in excuses. I think excuses are for weak people. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that out to people that take offense. I do that because it should motivate you as never have an excuse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Figure out how can I get that yeah. done? What resource can I tap into? Mm -hmm. And that's what I learned at a young age, and I've carried that through my career. And so I'm not the guy who listens to excuses. Yeah. I'm not the guy who wants to hear contractions. I want to hear how are we going to get done? And so one thing I've learned, I'm sure you guys have in commercial real estate or any real estate or any business, you have to be solutionary oriented. Mm -hmm. And life is always going to be that way, whether it's with your kids, whether it's with family, friends, colleagues, business associates, employees, you always have to be solutionary oriented. The best leaders in the world that I've learned through hundreds of mentors I have around the world to being in business for almost 30 years is Great leadership is solutionary oriented. It's balancing your emotions. Mm -hmm. It's taking a step back and saying, what's really happening here? And it's seeking the truth in what other people are saying to you as mm -hmm. well. And so what's beautiful about life that I want everyone to learn that's listening to this is life is about stacking experiences, and they change, and you learn, and you grow. And so one thing I tell people is I'm always growing. I love to grow. 
I do a lot of personal development. I meditate twice a day. I did before I get here. It centers me and grounds me to be present with the people I'm with because you two are the most important people in my life right now. Mm. That's how it is, and, and that's what I've learned. Yeah. And so for everyone out there is that when you can engage and be present with people, great things happen. Deep relationships, helping people, creating impact, uh, business mm-hmm. relationships. And I've learned over the years, stacking these experiences and knowledge from others and developing will never stop. And so people always ask me, like, do you really continue to learn? Absolutely. Every day. Maybe it's a book, a topic, or watching someone speak, or you know, listening yeah. to you guys, whatever it is, I always want to keep learning and growing, especially m- with technology going on in our age mm-hmm. and how it's changing and the new concepts that are coming back out and blockchain and all these things are going to change business over the years. We have to keep evolving and learning. Yeah. And so it's extremely important. Wow. You know, just to, just to harken back to the beginning of that, your journey here, mm-hmm. I think a lot of young people use their age as an excuse of why they can't invest, why they can't get into things. And they're like, oh, yeah, I would, but I'm only 23, 24, 25, whatever the thing is. Even people in their 30s are like, oh, I'm not 50, right? But I love that your story illustrates when you have just confidence and clarity and a deal, like people will overlook the age. Like mm-hmm. if, you're, if you're confident in the deal and you're well put together, you lay out the story, and I can see what – I, I can mm-hmm. care less if you're 19 or 90. Like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And so as soon as you get over that that mindset of like, oh, my age is restricting me and say, okay, no, mm-hmm. yes, I know, of course I'm young, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I love that your story illustrates that. A question for you around that when people come to you that are young, and I'm sure they ask you this question, it's like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to get into. Should I do residential, commercial? You did commercial, but residential is easy. What, do you, what advice do you give young people today about getting into real estate? Well, I say just do it. Just move forward. A lot mm-hmm. of people wait and they hesitate. Well, when I have enough money, or I have a balance sheet that's big enough to do this and that. And to go back to your point, which I think is really important that I learned at a young age, is if you have a good deal, you'll raise the money. Yeah, Mm -hmm. That's what I loved about syndication. People are like, well, are you going to... I'm like, I'm going to raise the money. This deal's incredible. Because I I knew the story. I knew how to protect my downside. I knew how to finance it properly. Yeah, And so... And I knew how to protect the investor's capital. And when you can do that for everyone out there, I don't care if you're a teenager to someone in your 70s or 80s, the deal will sell itself. Now, how you present it, whether it's your confidence, your capabilities, your track record, that's Mm -hmm. a different component of it. When you're getting started and I didn't have a track record, if you walk in and understand the numbers, understand the deal, understand the downside, and be able to tell the story, you will raise the money. I can guarantee you. I've lived it. I still do it, and I believe in it. And here's the thing that I teach is do your homework. Leverage into resources to do your homework. Ask questions. Most kids, and I call them kids in their 20s because I'm 54, (laughs) even though you guys are all adults, (laughs) how I look at it is be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It's tough when you're younger because you have to build up this house of cards of like, well, I got to get a loan. I got to do this. I got to raise equity. I got to show my friends that I'm I'm doing this because I'm worried about what they're going to say to me, which you shouldn't just worry about yourself. And so your mind starts playing tricks with you. Mm -hmm. And so the advice I can give everyone out there listening is just believe in yourself, learn about the deal, master it, master it. Don't learn the information, master the information. Yeah. So you don't have to look at anything. You'd be like, I'm going to pay an 8% preferred return. Uh, Here's what's going to happen when we sell the property. Here's how long we're going to own it. By the way, here are the issues we could be facing. Let me explain that to you. Here are the vacancy rates in the market. Here's the construction of the building. How much parking do we have, depending on the asset class I'm playing with? So for me, when I bought that industrial building, I was able to tell all these stories. Mm -hmm. I knew when it was built. I knew about the tenant, the credit worthiness of the tenants. And when you do that, you become the expert. Yeah, That's what people want. If you're going to shepherd capital and be a fiduciary of capital, people want the comfort level. And it's really the optics of this gentleman or woman knows what they're doing. Yeah. They're going to they're gonna give their heart and soul. Yeah. And it's that commitment, that love, I say, to a deal that allows you to raise equity. Mm-hmm. So to get back to your point, it's not about age. 
It's about doing your homework. It's about being prepared. It's understanding the market. Mm -hmm. And all these little things carry to the ability to get loans, to get equity. And I get asked this question all the time. And a lot of times the biggest issue is people are lazy. Mm -hmm. They won't do their homework. They, and I'll give you an example, and it's one thing I talk about, is you have to, in today's age, you have to do things differently, okay? You have to give without expecting anything in return. That's the power of networking. Mm-hmm. That's the power of building up your resources. Because people ask me all the time, well, Ben, how do I build up my resources in any business? Mm-hmm. And in order to do that, you have to give, and you have to be different. So, for example, I tell a young man or woman, I'm like, if you see me in a hotel and I'm about to get in an Uber, grab me and say, where are you going? And pay for, pay for my Uber. Yeah. And yeah. guess what? I'll remember your name. Yep. And maybe we do business. Maybe I help you. Maybe I give you some knowledge that changes your whole universe. Yeah. It's those little things you could do for people without expecting anything in return that carries through on resources. Mm-hmm. And it goes back to, I was telling you guys, when I first started in business, I was very fortunate to get involved in what was called the wine club. Yeah. It was it was about 12 guys from around the United States, all icons in commercial real estate. Now, you have to remember, I'm in my late 20s. I cannot afford a case of wine, okay, yeah. when I start research. Because cases of wine back in, you know, 90s were probably, you know, hundreds of dollars. Mm-hmm. I wasn't making that kind of money yet. You know, I was starting a family. And so for me, I said, okay, I'll do it. I was lucky to get invited in. I was 20 to 25 years younger than every other member, all icons. So I get my first assignment, and it's this guy who is a huge player in retail, owns tons of shopping centers around the country, he's well-known, and I'm nervous. And so I have so I did go back to my point. I did the homework, found out where can I buy a great case. I had to tell the story, give the tasting notes, okay, mm-hmm. And I shipped it to him with the notes. And that allowed me to open the door to ask questions and build resources and network. Because they would say, how old is Ben Reinberg? Oh, he's 28. He's 28. He's in this group. How do you get in the group? Like they were asking. But then what happened was they started showing me respect because of the homework I would do on the case of wine Mm -hmm. and the region and, and the knowledge. And they would learn from it. And they would enjoy it. They would yeah. drink it with their wife or their family and be like, that was a great case of bottle. Yeah. So it was creating leverage to build up research. Where do you get a good environmental engineer? How do I – I'm buying a deal in Atlanta, Georgia. What's a good bank I should talk to? Yeah. Yeah. It allowed me to learn and grow. That's how I'm on this podcast right now. Was that <laughs> was the case? Of yeah, or, we were at dinner one night yeah. and we were looking at the menu and there was was it a McAllen twenty five? Yeah, yeah. I think it was like four hundred and fifty bucks. Yeah, for a shot. And Brandon yeah. was like, "Man, I, I I want that or something like that." And it didn't end up getting it. And then the next day, I went out and bought a him giant a, bottle of it, McAllen twenty five <laughs> for him, and dropped it off at his house. Cannot afford that, but it was like, hey, you know, so that's a good moment. Um, Still sitting yeah. in my house, and we're gonna open uh, it someday. <clears throat> we're gonna open it someday, and look and look uh, what happens. Yeah, yeah. Like now, you guys are doing a podcast, and you guys yeah. are growing. Yeah, and that's what it's about. Yeah, and so, so right, I yeah. always tell people, if you can give without expecting anything in return, God or the universe or whatever you believe in will reward you. In yeah. commercial real estate, I call it the real estate gods. Because a lot of the acquisition guys, even that work for me, they'll say, you know, we're struggling. It's been a tough month. We're struggling to find stuff to buy. And and what I said, if you make enough calls and you commit Mm -hmm. and you put your mind like, I'm going to find a deal this week. I'm going to put it under a letter of intent. The real estate gods will reward you. And they go, what do you mean? I go, after a year you work here, you'll see what I mean. They always come back and they say, I understand it's the work ethic. It's doing things different. It's Mm -hmm. spending more time. It's continuing to yeah. develop our knowledge of commercial real yeah. estate. And I, I think with the give, it has to be creative, you know, because we I, all the time I have people reach out to me like, what can I do to help you? Or what can I, you know, yeah. I just want to support you somehow. And then that creates coffee. more work for, for me. Whereas I think of a guy back in St. Louis where yeah. when I, I was doing acquisitions a lot and I was driving all the time and I put out like on an Instagram story about how much I just hated driving from place to place. And he literally, he reached out and he said, Cameron, 
I'll drive you um, this week. He's like, I'll drive you everywhere you need to go. You can sit in the back and you can work. Um, he didn't ask for anything in return, but obviously that turned into conversations as he was driving me from house to house and I got to sit in the back and work. And I thought that was just such like a brilliant yeah. give um, where it, it, he, he told me what he could do. It wasn't like, hey, Cameron, how can I help you? And it was creative, you know, it was something that you don't think of. And now that guy is in my corner, like if I have a deal or anything, yeah. he's the person I'm going to reach out to. And it, it's it's so well said because... It's exactly what you have to do in this day mm -hmm. and age. You have to do things differently. Yeah. So whether my Uber story or that yeah. story is if you could do enough homework on the person. So for me, sometimes when we buy de deals, I like to go kick the bricks and mortar of every property mm -hmm. that we own. People are like, are you really do that? Like, do you have the time? I enjoy doing it. I think it's a good thing for our investors yeah. where Ben Reinberg is actually mm -hmm. going to go see the property we're investing in. It doesn't matter who he is or how busy he is. And so... What I do is I prep for that seller. We are we are a huge uh, medical office owner around mm -hmm. the country, one of the leaders. And I was in Savannah, Georgia, and it was during COVID. And I was buying a deal from a cardiology group, and the lead doctor is into wine like I am. Mm -hmm. So I did some homework on him. I found out what kind of wine he likes. I'm staying at a hotel that actually has a wine cellar that sells wine. I buy him like... $250 bottle of wine that I knew he would love. I walk in, first thing I do, I give it to him. Break slice, everything. First of all, it was great for due diligence. I learned everything about the property, all the mm -hmm. nuances, how we're going to add value. <clears throat> and then Cam and Brandon, what was interesting is he becomes an investor. Mm. Happens a oh. lot on deals. These doctors end up saying, "How do? what do you do? Yeah. Well, this is <laughs> yeah. what we do. We buy medical properties. We have investors like yourself, and we buy them from folks like yourself as well, really. Now, all of a sudden, one guy becomes 20. Mm. Yeah. Do it your works. homework. Can, can you go into a little bit? I mean, there's there's a million places I want to take this, but can we just talk about medical office for a minute? Like, I've Absolutely. never interviewed somebody who does medical office investing. So what is that What is that like? How do you find those deals? Like, why would they sell them? Who's selling Like, well, give them the lay down. Everyone knows me as saying, I, I believe it's the human body is never going out of style. Mm -hmm. So it's pandemic and recession resilient type real estate. Not proof, but resilient. So during the pandemic, we collected all our rents. And we were expanding more and more into that product type. I've been investing in medical office, my company, for about 20 years now. And then eight years ago, a friend of mine called me and said, you really should look at veterinary office because it's comparable to medical. Mm -hmm. So now we do that as well, oh. which is fascinating. And there's a vet office for sale here in Kia. I don't know if you saw it. But there you go. Yeah. I'll take a look. So <laughs> yeah. we in veterinary, what's interesting is that it's not just dogs and cats. It's reptiles is yeah. huge. We own a uh, horse, and, horse and cattle surgery center and birthing center in, in Texas. And so different asset classes mm -hmm. within the veterinarian space we own, which is fascinating. And so with medical, what I love about medical is the human body is never going out of style. And we invest in anything that you and your family would go see. Mm -hmm. And so what I talk about on social media and, and to people when they ask me about it is if you think about it, is that the revenue is generated also from the real estate that these doctors are in. Yeah, mm -hmm. Think about it. I need to be at that location with that equipment in order to take care of Brandon's kids. And so it's challenging for them to move. They build deep roots in the community. Yep. And they're providing a service to the community and a mm -hmm. brand. And so the last thing you want to do is say, sorry, Brandon, I'm going to pick up and move, and you're going to have to drive another four miles to come see me? I don't think so. Yeah. So the renewal rates are in the upper 80 percentile for medical office if yeah. you find mm -hmm. the right properties and deals. Now, things can change. Mm -hmm. We had COVID, and dialysis was a big staple in my career. It's how I got started in medical office. Fascinating story. And with dialysis, because of COVID, a lot of folks have passed away. Mm -hmm. And so they had to consolidate and downsize the amount of facilities they have. That happens in life. But generally speaking... They put a tremendous amount of investment in the properties, deep roots, and they're conservative investments. So what I call them is safe, secure, profitable investment because we mm -hmm. add value. And we have a mid-20s IRR track record in medical, which is phenomenal. And I owe that yeah. to a lot of talented people at my company, Alliance, and, and my resources and the people around me. And again, that's doing your homework and gaining mm -hmm. knowledge in the space. 
What's hard about medical is there's so many nuances. <clears throat> it takes years to really understand the different niches, mm -hmm. what makes a profitable investment, why is this group going to be successful, how does it fit, maybe it's tied to a hospital system. Mm -hmm. There's so many nuances yeah. I've had to learn. Now, what I love about that is it creates a high barriers to entry yep. for people to come in mm -hmm. to the space. So I'm an office industrial and retail expert. That's what I am known as. And the medical office is a large niche of ours. And so um, we've been doing it for years. Do you aim, by the way, that's one thing I like about mobile home parks too, is mobile home parks are super hard for, to yep. understand. They like sure there's are. so many nuances to it. Yep. It's like, yeah, it took me, it's taken me five years to get to where I am today. And I still don't know half of what there is to know about a mobile home park. Right. Uh, so yeah, the barrier of entry is actually a good thing. I think majority of the world looks at a problem and says, oh, that's hard. I'm going to avoid it. Yes. Where you looked at the problem and said, that's hard. I'm going to master it. Yeah. I have a tendency where I run into the fire. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> because when people say, well, it's too challenging. So I'm like, I'll figure that out. Yeah. Because I'm a futurist. Yeah. I mean, that's what a lot of people say that he's a futurist. Like, He'll, he'll see things before other people. Do you look for single-tenant properties or multi-tenant properties when you're buying these medicals or, or, or both? We do both. Okay. So we'll buy – it's all net lease product. We'll buy single-tenant and multi-tenant. Mm -hmm. And a little bit different underwriting on both, uh, different ways to analyze cash flow. And what I tell people – and this is a misnomer, and sometimes I do a reel on this because I want people to learn out in the, in the ether in the world – is that – Stop using the word cap rate. Mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, understand what that really means. And what it really means is understanding what are the risks, what are the returns I'm looking at, am I putting leverage debt on the property, how is that going to impact my cash flow? I always say look at it unlevered, your cash flow, and then figure out what you want to pay for it. Figure out what you want to pay your investors. Because the brokerage community says, well, I'm going to sell it at an 8 cap, it's a great deal. And I'll say, well, what does that really mean to you? And they can't explain it because no one teaches the business the right way. And the right way is understand the real estate fundamentals, vacancy rates, absorption rates, what's market rent, um, what's the construction. If I'm in medical, I want five or six to one parking ratio. Mm -hmm. That's important. You go with your families or your wife does or whoever to the doctor and she can't get a spot because people are sitting there for two or three hours for whatever procedure she's going to have done, she's going to get aggravated. She's going to be like, screw this, I'm going to the next guy. Yeah. So parking is critical. Mm. And you have to be able to understand all this because it ties into your valuation of the property. Yeah. So when people throw around all this jargon in real estate, especially commercial real estate, find out how they really, if they really understand what that really means. Yeah. And that's the education that has to be pushed, especially in commercial real estate. It's a sophisticated game. It's a lot of terms. It's a lot of knowledge you have to develop. And so I'm always constantly teaching. So if somebody's listening to this and they want to start acquiring that knowledge, like what, what's the first step to finding that? It's Because that stuff's hard to – you can't just Google it if you don't know it what is. to Google. I mean, like what's one of the things that we're looking at, they're looking at my schedule of time, is I want to start teaching it. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to yeah. and it's part of my new show, Leverage, is part of all these things of the ability to help teach what I do mm -hmm. so some young person out there can go learn how to build wealth. You know, I have, a, I have a mission in my life, especially being from Chicago. I would love, and I know I'm going to do this in the near future, I would love to take a kid from the south side of Chicago that maybe has no hope, mm -hmm. gang infested, um, education is, is not really yeah. at, at a high level mm -hmm. where it should be, and take a young man or woman and teach them commercial real estate so they can build a legacy. How many people would that person impact in their family? Dude, that's a show community? right there. Wouldn't that be a legit That'd show? That would be great. Like a whole season right. of taking somebody from just right. a to Z. rough. Yeah. Right, and just rough neighborhood, yeah. and and next thing you know, they're, they're buying their first deal, they're buying more and more, and creating jobs creating a community, being able to bring in his colleagues and get, offer them opportunities, and how much of an impact would they have on thousands of people just from one person? I think that would be really important to do. And so a lot of it to me is, as I've grown in the business, eventually I'm going to have someone running my company alliances. I want to do different things. And part of that is creating that impact is teaching the business the right way. Mm -hmm. I felt that the baby boomers in our business, especially in Chicago, it was so cutthroat. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, we don't want Reinberg coming in because he's so aggressive. He's going to compete with us eventually. 
or maybe surpass us. And so they wouldn't want to teach you. Mm -hmm. See, I like it the other way. I'd rather teach you because guess what? I'm going to have more opportunities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be able to leverage and get more resources because I helped you. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of people are short-sighted in the business. And so for me, I felt that if I could take the approach of help first, yep. mm -hmm. uh, it will always serve me. It reminds me of that quote, you can have anything you want in life if you just help enough other people get what they want. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It's like the more people I teach real estate investing to, yeah. shockingly, the more deals I get. The and more people want to work with me. Yeah, the right. more people. And <laughs> equity is easier. Yeah, exactly. And lenders. Yeah. Yep. And... Everything is easier. Right. Exactly. The more people I help. And That's so. Right. Yeah, a lot of people have asked, you know, what I'm, why am I, why am I teaching? Why am I still doing podcasts? And I mean, it's selfish, like, right. cause I just yeah. keep getting more, That's <laughs> the right. more I help. That's yes. Right. Part of me wants to help people. Of course we all want to help people, but it's also very selfish driven. Like the more people well, we help, I look at it a different way. My life is say on this podcast, one of us is saying something and there's some younger man, man or woman out there listening and they pick up one thing that spurns an idea. Yep. Mm -hmm that changes the trajectory of what they're doing, their life, mm -hmm. relationships, whatever it is, that's that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And that's that goes beyond being selfish. It's it's okay to be selfish. Yeah. You know, but when you're selfish and you're helping people yeah. and you're changing viewpoints and thoughts, that's yeah. an incredible thing that you're doing. Yeah. If by being selfish you help other people, is it really being selfish? No, oh, that's a philosophy <laughs> that's question. Right. I guess we, we could do another show <laughs> yes. on that. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting one. What are the biggest dangers of commercial real estate investing, as you've seen? Well, the biggest dangers I see is under not having the right underwriting, inappropriate mm -hmm. underwriting, yeah. not having enough reserves, uh, not doing enough homework on the research. Mm -hmm. You know, the real estate fundamentals. Yeah. The biggest issue too is over leveraging properties. Yeah. One of the things I saw, and we used to do this, is we would put MESDET. MESDET was a big thing. Yeah, years can you explain ago. MESDET for those? So, MESDET is I would have a first mortgage or yeah. some of you states that have trust, deed of trust, or you call them trust deeds. You'd have a first lien position. Yep. And then let's say that first lien position was 65% loan to value. And between that and my purchase price, I might get another 5 or 10, 15% that was in second position, yep. and they call that MESDAT. It would be more expensive. Mm -hmm. They would be behind the first mortgage or the first trust deed. And so now I have 85 or 90% leverage. Yep. So if I'm taking down a large office campus in St. Louis, yeah. which I've owned, and I bring in a MESDAT, and God forbid Warren Buffett has a trucking company that's a large tenant of mine in a building, and he leaves two floors, and all of a sudden, I can't hit my debt service covenants. Yep. I can't pay my investors the return. I'm struggling to pay my, my mortgage. All of a sudden, I have issues. Yeah. And so that particular situation, I was young. We were over-levered on a property. So I've learned is you want to have enough equity mm -hmm. in your acquisitions, yep. in your properties. And I'll tell you another thing that's so relevant in this market that people don't think about. So we're in a rising interest rate market. Yeah. It's been tempered a little bit lately. But last year, especially in 23, we're seeing interest rates continue to rise. And I've seen this environment before. Well, let me give everyone out there an example. If you are buying a home, a residential real estate, you're a fix and flipper, you're commercial real estate, whatever you're buying, any asset in the world, if you have enough equity and you're in a rising interest rate market or a bad economy or whatever is going to happen in 2025, if you have enough equity and you are in a rising interest rate market, guess what? You'll be able to refinance that yep. property. Why? Because maybe you were at 60 LTV loan to value yep. to the purchase price. And in a rising interest rate market, they revalue it. And now you're at 60, let's say you're at 50 LTV. They'll still refinance it for you. Yep. And if you have enough reserves in the bank, because you're building up reserves, maybe you contribute it. So Flexibility is really important yeah. in commercial real estate. I, I always preach flexibility. I preach have enough equity in deals. Don't over leverage. The key to commercial real estate, and I say this frequently, is the ability to hold, the ability to hold, the ability to hold. Yeah. It's not about location. It's mm -hmm. about because what most people don't know in commercial real estate is commercial real estate cash flows are like moguls. Mm -hmm. They don't just descend in the air. 
Now, sometimes they do on our deals, and it's a beautiful thing. But generally speaking, if you've been in the business long enough, you know you're going to see ups and downs and dips in cash flow. So you have to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. And so what do you need to do? You need to build reserves. You need to understand and do your homework on the acquisition. You need to surround yourself with great resources. And all these things lead to safe, secure, profitable investments. That's why people invest in Alliance. It's not just Ben Reinberg. We have 200 plus years of leadership team experience in the business. And guess what? That becomes solutionary oriented. So go back to my comment about being solutionary oriented. If you know that cash flows are going to be like moguls, you have to be solutionary oriented, yeah. mm -hmm. especially in this environment where we had rising interest rates. In commercial real estate, here's a great stat for everyone. It's I've never seen in my career in 30 years. From 22 to 23, commercial real estate transactions were down 65%. Wow. I, were, I was having brokers call me and saying, so what's going on at Alliance? <laughs> I don't know. We're looking for deals. It's been a challenge out there. There's a gap between the bid and the mm -hmm. ass. Yep. And uh, you guys are overvaluing these properties, and that's why they're not selling, and that's what happened. Mm -hmm. So the biggest challenge, these are some of the challenges I see. And a lot of it, Brandon and Cam, stem from not continuing to grow knowledge, research, homework. All the, It's those little things mm -hmm. that people don't do because the brokers are lazy. Yeah, they, they uh, We're in the middle of a deal right now, okay? And... Broker puts together an offering memorandum, young guy. And I, I taught him a lot. I hope all the lesson I taught in this deal, it's going to carry through with him. And so it's in Texas, which we're a huge owner in Texas. And <laughs> he, he forgets to include there's an insurance number that the landlord's responsible for. Totally changes mm -hmm. the net operating, yeah. but uh -huh. changes the value. Dang. So we put it under contract. And I get on the phone. We do a kickoff call with every seller, and I'm always on it because I always explain the process and build a relationship. There's things that spin off from that call. And one of my acquisition guys uh, didn't know about this. We don't have the lease. And I said, this is a uh, million dollars of value. We have to tell it that we're off. So I had to ex educate the sellers and the broker and everything. Again, the broker did not abstract the lease review the lease before he while he was taking the listing, which is a no-no. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, it's being methodical, doing your homework, taking the time to understand things, and that way you build these stacking experiences in mm -hmm. your career and life. And, and so what I always say to people is slow down. Give yourself space. I say this to my employees and colleagues and when they ask me for advice too is give yourself space to think. So every day I take an hour or two just to think, oh, what am I doing? How do I get better? What am I not doing well? What do I have to continue to learn? How did I treat this person? Can I do what? Let me reflect on that. Yeah. And so everyone is moving at the speed of light with technology. What's great about you guys is being in Maui, it slows things down for you. Yeah. It'll, when I'm in California, things have slowed down compared to Chicago. Chicago moves really fast compared to California. Mm -hmm. And it's allowed me to think, and it's allowed me to reflect and learn. Like when you can slow things down, you can speed up everything, processes, mm -hmm. deal flow, social mm -hmm. media content. Yeah. The list goes on and on. And so, when I look at this young man that put together this package on this deal, if he would just slow down and realize, like, I have to abstract the lease, I have to value this properly. Whether the seller is happy or not, or I'm not going to mm -hmm. get the listing. It doesn't serve you, and it hurts you more to not do the proper job up front. Yeah. And that's something I see. I teach my kids this. I teach other young men and women this is just slow down. Mm -hmm. I know we want with technology, everything's got to be instant, mm -hmm. texting and direct messages and emails. And, but everyone forgets the little things. Mm -hmm. We're all humans, and yeah. human nature is getting thrown out of the window in this society. And it's something that I always preach. That's why I'm a big phone guy. If you ever want to talk to Ben Reinberg, all you have to do is pick up the phone because he's going to answer it because yeah. I love the phone. That's how I learn business in life. Yeah. So I hate texting. I hate Because <laughs> I, I, I think, too. well, it's think about this, especially you guys know you're in the middle of a deal and there's something that needs to be explained or <clears throat> clarified. Yeah. How do you do that over a text? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, 
AI is out and I'm using AI to text, which is great because it gives me a choice, friendly, romantic, flirty. <laughs> it it's cool. But it so doesn't a, express. Wait, AI can text for you? Yeah. Well, no, it doesn't text. It gives uh, me a choice of how I will. So I'm a very direct person uh -huh. when you get to know me. <laughs> and someone said to me, you know, you should get this AI program. I think it will like soften you a little bit. <laughs> oh, and I said, <laughs> okay, I'll show it to you. That's so funny. I started texting people and like, or if I'm really busy, uh, I'll give you one line. And they're like, why is he being such a dad? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why is he, why is he, why is he so curt with yeah, me? Yeah. I'm not, I'm just busy. I'm yeah. trying to give you the information. So I'm not, you don't feel avoided or I'm not delaying, right? It's all yeah. instant gratification, which is what we're talking about. And so I found this AI, uh, whatever connector it's called, and it allows me to say, well, okay, I'm going to take this one sentence and make it friendly. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, what's up? I love that. It's so great <laughs> to so hear funny. from you. Uh. And so what's funny is my team um, and my leadership team and my resources are like, what's going on with you? <laughs> <laughs> like, do we, need an, do we need an intervention? Because you're uh, acting strange. Yeah. But it's a good way to kind of so deal bad. with people differently. Ooh. And so communication is something that, one of the things people say, well, what do you work on constantly? Mm -hmm. I always work on my communication. Mm -hmm. I always work on understanding people. I love human behavior. And it's why we brought in um, a well-known, respected human behaviorist into my company because I was struggling for years of with this remote hybrid workforce. I was watching the workforce, and I saw all these high performers leaving companies. Mm -hmm. And I said, why is that? What's going on here? I saw, you know, we'd interview people and we'd see the job hopping going on. And I said, why is this happening? And so I reached out and searched for the best human behaviorists to be able to leverage into our company. And so what we do is we do playbooks mm -hmm. on all my employees and allows our company to align with their personal life, their career, and their future. And so what we learn with all our employees around the country that I think is fascinating is they're all into health and wellness, mm, yeah. just like Ben Reinberg is. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, your vibe attracts your tribe. I guess yeah. so. What a great term, yeah. your vibe attracts your tribe. And then we learn for career, everyone wants to be mentored or coached, yeah. which we do a lot of when we bring in people. And then for their future, they want to learn about investments. I go, oh, we're an investment company. That's interesting. Yeah. So yeah. we talk about that and they're learning. So they're aligned with us. What's interesting is that with our team, when we go through your playbook on a weekly basis, we make you accountable. Like, Cam, you might say to me, if you're on my team, I want to work out four days a week. Mm -hmm. And we'll look at it and we'll say, okay, did you do that this week? And be like, no, I didn't. Or I was eating fast food three times a day and, and I want to eat healthy. And What ends up happening is, let's say you're in acquisitions mm -hmm. and you have to make 250 calls for the week and you made 100 calls. We can go to your playbook and see what's going on in your life. Yeah, I'll be like, why are you? Great. I'll be like, Kim, why are you not sleeping? Yep. And you'll be like, well, you know, I've been on Instagram. I'm worried about this and that. I'm like, well, put your phone 30 feet away from the bed, yeah. and I'll start helping them. That's we, literally what we do in the Better Life Tribe. Is everyone gets a journal and they have yeah. to just check their habits, and then you meet once a week and you show. And that's like, brilliant. Yeah, you just, mm -hmm. when you when you take your life and put them into KPIs, yeah. and mm -hmm. get some accountability. Like, yeah. you, I love that you're doing that in your company. I've not yeah. done that in Open Door Capital or yeah. Better Life, but dude, I'm totally gonna take it's, that. It's it's so cool because what ends up happening is we build a community. Mm -hmm. Forget about yeah. the word culture. We're building a community, yeah. Yeah. and so we attract great talent, and we care about our employees because. Everyone shies away, especially with labor laws and everything. Is I can't get involved in a personal life. Yeah, yeah. But your personal life and your business life flow into each yeah, other this. and vice versa. And that's when I learned, I'm like, people are losing people because they're asking them to fill out a survey and they're resenting that. Yeah. Instead of understanding, how am I going to handle human behavior? Human behavior lead to the actions mm -hmm. of your employees and everyone else in the world. And so when you can put a universe together yeah. of understanding who they are as a person and you take time to care mm -hmm. and you hold them accountable, great things happen. Because guess what? You don't have to ask twice. And and a lot of great things happen in our company because of that. So um, it's really been a blessing. And so again, you want to talk about growth. Uh, if you asked me 30 years ago, I started 20 years ago, are we going to do this kind of stuff? I would say, Kim, you're crazy. We're, <laughs> yes. we're never doing that, is it? Yeah. You know, but... And it's why people say, well, why are you so into personal development? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, about 10 years ago, I was looking at myself in the mirror 
and I didn't like what I was seeing. Mm -hmm. I had this strong armor. I was this Chicago kid who was selling cigarettes, who had to just fight for existence, and I had older brothers, and I just realized like I had to be this tough person. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, after 10 years, like how do I take off this armor and, and become the real Ben Reinberg? which yeah. led to my Instagram yeah, and the handle, real, The Real Ben Reinberg. I wanted awesome. to that's... figure out, like, who am I really as a person? Because I was so tied to commercial real estate and business mm -hmm. for years, and that's when I got into personal development. I started working on myself, and then years ago I got into meditation. And what ended up happening was it allowed me to become better in business, mm -hmm. but also better to people around me. I was attracting great people. Business was growing. Um and it's allowed me to create impact that yeah. I've never been able to create before. So it's that's why I'm into it. So, go ahead. So a question I have for you, because you talked about this earlier, and I think all of this ties in is where in your business or for you personally, it's like slow down, slow down, slow down. And my favorite part of the day is sitting in the sauna because I mm, don't bring my yeah. phone in. There's no screens. There's no – and I can sit there. And in the 15, 20 minutes I'm in the sauna, I have my best thoughts of the day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is outside of the sauna, I never have that moment again. So how do you – like, how do you work that into your life? How do you slow gonna, down for one or two you. hours a day? I love that question. Love it. And I hope this helps you because that's why I'm here is there's, there's a couple things. Mm -hmm. What I do is in my office, I will, before a big negotiation or anything, I will take time, I'll sit on my couch or in my office chair, and I'll meditate for 10, 15 minutes mm -hmm. before I get into something that's going to be heavy or, or just need to ground myself. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm stressed. Maybe someone triggered you. Yeah. Give yourself time. I've, Kim, I've been in a situation and I remember this from one of the ladies. I was going, I was at a hotel and I had 30 people waiting for me. Mm -hmm. It was in Georgia. And I said to her, I said, go on in. She goes, what's going on? I go, I need some time to myself. I had them wait 15 minutes for mm -hmm. me. She said, where is he? They were saying, where is he? Um, he's he's out in the hall meditating. And they're like, oh, okay. Because they knew the expectation, yeah. like he needs it. So I laid the expectations. I did it. I went in, crushed the meeting got what I need done, help people. And so love yourself, give yourself space. Mm -hmm. You're about to go into negotiation or you have a big meeting or you're going to see your kid's school teacher and you know there's going to be issues that you got to solve. Give yourself the clarity to be present. Mm -hmm. That's what it's going to allow you to do. So take a step back. Sometimes you have to check yourself in life, and all of us do. I do this frequently as take a step back and say, how am I behaving? How yeah. am I feeling? Like we never asked, like when I was a kid, I never knew what emotions were. Yeah. Like it wasn't acceptable to cry. Mm -hmm. It wasn't acceptable to be. So I had to learn like, how am I feeling? And why am I feeling this way? Why am I bitter towards this person? Mm -hmm. That's silly. And so I take a step back and I look at a situation and I'll give myself space. That way when I go into whatever is next, Mm -hmm. I'm the best version I can be. Yeah. And I'm going to help. I'm going to listen. I'm going to be a good listener. I'm going to look you in the eye. I'm going to care about you. And guess what? Deeper relationships, more money, more satisfaction, more fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And when I go back 10 years, I was not fulfilled. I was doing amazing, making millions and millions of dollars, successful, written up in magazines. Like you would say, like, what's wrong with you? I wasn't fulfilled in mm -hmm. life. And that's part of it is when you can take a step back and slow things down, mm -hmm. it will create all these incredible things for you. I love that. And you'll learn and you'll knowledge and you'll listen. And because a lot of people in that situation, when you're stressed or you're rushing, your listening skills suck. Mm -hmm. I, I've been through it. I still have to check myself at the door. When I'm not listening well, I grab him. I'm like, all right, Ben, mm -hmm. you're acting like the old Ben. Yeah. Get your shit together. <laughs> that's what yeah. I say to myself. I call myself out. Mm -hmm. But there's one thing I also learned that I could teach your audience it, I thought was really healthy for me that one of my mentors taught me is don't gossip. Mm -hmm. And people are like, what does that really mean? Don't gossip about other people. Don't gossip about yourself. Don't gossip to yourself about other people. And don't gossip to other people about other people. Yeah. And if you do that, the universe will reward you. 
Mm. Give people a chance. Learn about them. Seek the truth in what others are saying to you. Mm -hmm. And those were big lessons I learned in life that allowed me to get to this point. Because people think like, well, how do you get this far in commercial real estate? How do you become this in business? It's not just mastering the business. You got to master yourself. Yeah. And that was the lesson that I learned that I carry through with me. So if I could pass that down to my kids or whoever I teach or learn, it's, yeah, master what you're doing and become great at it, mm-hmm. but also show up as the best version of yourself because that person is going to create impact and help others. Mm-hmm. And that's what's going to build your resources. That's what's going to that's going to attract money into your life, opportunities. And that's what's important. Yeah. But no one wants to talk about it because everyone's worried. And that's why when we talk about human behavior, personal and business, I said, well, I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to be the guy who, mm-hmm. who breaks that barrier yeah. and says, screw the labor laws. We're all humans. But no one's willing to talk about the employee that's struggling mm-hmm. at home or, or mentally or has mental health issues or maybe alcohol or drugs, and we're just going to shy away from it and not step up and say something, it's insane. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what I've learned. And that's part of my mission is, you know, I was put on this earth, I did a deep dive on myself to really serve and help people. Mm. That's, why I sh- that's what I love doing. That's yeah. what I gravitate to. That's where I'm fulfilled. Yeah. yeah. And these are the things I've learned and continue to learn. Love it. The, the most healthy culture uh, that I ever worked in was at a church. Mm-hmm. And one of the coolest things that they did is every single person that worked there they had to go to counseling once a week, and they, they paid for it. And it was just like, we want you to be healthy in your in your personal life because we know that that's going to overflow into your your work yeah. life. Um, and it was so amazing. Yeah, um, that's cool. And they paid for it. That was that was the best part because I yeah. at that time yeah, now now that. I'm different, but I was yeah. you know 24, 25 years old. And I'm like I'm not spending 130 bucks a week on a counselor, right? Um, but they would yeah. pay for it, and it was that's incredible. Cool. Yeah, I I it's funny. I love religion. So I'm Jewish. I grew up in an area you were either Jewish, Italian, or Mexican. Mm-hmm. Okay, I was telling uh, your colleague out there about this because his mom grew up in the same area, mm. but it was a real tight knit area. And so I wasn't very religious as a kid. Uh, my grandfather escaped the Holocaust, came from Poland. He was more religious, and my mother. But I was, I was, we were very reformed. Mm-hmm. Come in, but. I've always been a man of God and believed in faith, and, and especially being in commercial real estate, you do a lot of praying to God. Yeah. <laughs> and right God has been extremely good to me, and we're good yeah. friends. And what's but what was interesting is I also um, understood Catholicism mm-hmm. as a kid. So one of the things I did was I used to go to midnight mass, and mm-hmm. we did that to meet girls. <laughs> and so a, a lot of my friends were Italian, and so... We'd go to midnight mass, we'd have dinner and drinking and fun, and then we'd bring the girls back, and it was just, a, it was a brilliant <laughs> yeah. move. But one thing I did was I really enjoyed listening to the priest that would give the sermons mm-hmm. that night, and I got into it, and so it was in my hometown, and so one day I walked in from high school, and there was confession going on, and some lady walked out, I walked into the box. Now, I'm probably not supposed to do that, but I did. I walked in the box, and he says, you know, young lad, how can I help you? And he had an Irish accent. And I said, you know, I said, uh, I said, Father, I'm Jewish, but uh, I was wondering if we could talk because I wanted to tell him some of my troubles and stuff. So I, for four or five years, that's what I did. Every week mm. I walked in, and he allowed me to do confession, yeah. to have a conversation and create impact. So... Before I graduated college, I went back to see him and gave him a hug. And so the moral of the story is it doesn't matter what religion you are or where you're from. If you can embrace it and learn and continue to learn, you'll be able to do great in life. Yeah. And so um, God's been a big presence in my life, especially in commercial real estate. And I've learned and respected. I love learning about religion. I have women and men from all walks of life, different religions, different faith and stuff, and it's so fascinating to me yeah. when we have conversations. And so if you have that respect and understanding of people and their differences, a lot of great things happen. And I think it's something that 
we have to learn as a society is that we're all different. We all have different DNAs. We come from different backgrounds. But if we help each other, incredible things always happen. And that's you, what I've learned. Would you consider yourself religiously Jewish then today, or, or how do you how I, do you view God? Today I, in I view God as more as like independent. Okay. You know, yes, I'm Jewish, and I still believe in that faith. But I have so many other faiths that I've learned about that mm. I totally have an appreciation for. Yeah. yeah. And so for me, I just look at God and I pray frequently of when I just need clarity on yeah. a situation. And that's what God's provided me is the ability to take a step back and say, Ben, you got to get better, mm-hmm. or we got yeah. we got to work on this, or good job with that. And so I just, it, to me, it's given me a lot of clarity. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, some people think I'm crazy, something like that, but it's yeah. something that I believe in. That's why we... A little bit controversial to a lot of people about what I'm about to say, but I'm, I'm a big believer that all truth is God's truth. I love yep. that phrase, right? Yep. So I even that, you know, I'm a Christian guy. Uh-huh. I can say, hey, I love how Buddhism emphasizes, emphasizes meditation. I can take that truth and I can bring it into my life. Now, I'm not saying all roads lead to the same place. I'm not trying to you know argue that. I'm just saying there's there's goodness and truth in a lot of religions. I That's mean, probably right. every religion has goodness and truth in there. That's right. And we can pull from those and learn from those. And then implement them in our lives, and uh, yeah, you, maybe yeah. Again, people will probably get pissed that I said that, but well, it's I, I totally agree with you. I mean, if you read the Bible, yep. I don't care what religion you are. There's like some incredible things yeah, really you can pull truth. out of that yep. that just allow you to think and reflect. You're like, wow, yeah. that's interesting. Mm-hmm. And so I like that. I like you know some of the people I follow online. You know, they'll quote a thing from the the Bible and they'll explain it, and I'm like, that's an interesting take. Yeah. So again, if if you're open to learning, and I if people say, well, what's the key to success? Continue to learn. Yeah. Continue to grow. Yeah. Especially in this day and age, I mean, things are moving so fast with technology yeah. and knowledge. And so if you can improve your knowledge, that's great leverage. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, let's, before we kind of start to wrap the show up, I'd love to know a little bit about your biohacking kind of background and your history there. I know you said, uh, specifically, I want to go, we can go a few places here, but you mentioned you were a wine guy, you loved wine, and yes. then you said you stopped drinking. You yes. told me that earlier. Yes. So what was that trans- transition like from a guy who loves wine yes. to not drinking? Um, so a few years ago, I, I tried stem cell. I have a okay. friend of mine who's a doctor in California, and he's big into stem cells. And so... We met, we hit it off when I moved out to California a couple of years ago. And he started telling me about it. And I have celiac when I'm gluten free. And it's a digestive issue I have. And my I family should, does too. Shouldn't have brought pizza last night. Well, yeah. that's, that's what, you know what? I, I told your assistant, I said, she, she felt bad. And I said, don't worry about it. I said, I'm, I'm going to eat at the hotel. So it's yeah. all good. And by the way, last night was fabulous. Oh, I mean, amazing. it didn't matter what food. It was great. <laughs> the views were incredible. Great people. You th- Brandon, you threw a great event, well, so you. I'm very, I'm very uh, appreciative of it. And then, so, um, so we were talking about it, and I, and he said, "Do you wear glasses?" I said, "Yeah, I wear progressive glasses." He goes, "All right, I'm going to give you two shots in the temple, and let's see what happens." Ever since I don't stem wear glasses, cells in the head? stem cells. Like, I had no. right here in the temple, really? one here. Right. And I'm literally on the phone with one of the ladies that works for me, and she's watching it, and she's going like this, Ooh, yeah. and I'm looking at her. I'm like, "Don't do that." I'm like, "Uh." Uh-uh. <laughs> I'm like, and so it goes in you in the soft spot and injects it in you, and then you take vitamins as well. And what he said to me was, "All right, you're not going to drink for nine. I want you to not drink for ninety days." Mm-hmm. Once I did that, I started feeling the effects. I said. You know, Brandon, what's the benefits of drinking? Mm. And I started really researching yep. it. I'm like, I'm putting, I'm putting poison in my body. Yep. Why? Because I, I, I'm self-medicating myself. Like, mm. you know, I had a hard day and have a glass of, of bourbon, yep. which I love, and yep. or a glass of wine. You know, I do enjoy a glass of wine with a good meal. Yeah. Okay. And once in a while, I'm sure I'll pick it up. I'll have it. I mean, I'm not gonna stop drinking forever. But what I've learned is. How do I become the best version of myself? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't like myself or anyone on alcohol. And so a year and a half ago, I stopped drinking, and it's been a great decision. I have a lot of energy. I feel good. I look good. 
Um, I'm 54 years old. Yeah, you look like um, you're like 38. Yeah, yeah and I've been, <laughs> I've been. So when they did a, a test of who I am and my strength and everything, I'm, I'm like a young man in my 30s. Yeah. Wow. And that's a good thing. So I want to live as long as possible. I want to help as many people. And so when it comes to biohacking, I do stem cells. Um, I take care of myself. I eat very healthy. I have a trainer in California. I work out with him five days a week. Wow. Um, I'm, I have a morning routine. And I take care of myself. I take care of my mental health. I mean, I have my middle brother, most people don't know this, is mentally ill. Mm. And so mental health has been a big thing for me, a big advocate. And so I take all these things to answer your question, and I look at it and say, well, how do I become the best version of myself and healthy and uh, create impact? It's like, well, drinking's not going to help. Yeah. yeah. You know, or even smoking a cigar, that's not going to help. Or are eating like crap, that's not going to help. So again, I take a step back and I say, okay. And a lot of people like Brandon, just like you and camp, a lot of people depend on you and your decisions. So if I'm not the best version of myself, yeah. who am I really serving at the yeah. end of the day? And I learned that. And for everyone out there listening is if you have people that are depending on you, employees or significant other yeah. or kids or parents or whoever you're helping, mm -hmm. Think about your behavior and what you're putting in your body. It will impact you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what I learned. And so I, I'm i a big Pellegrino guy. Mm -hmm. You give me a Pellegrino with ice and a lime, and I'm yours. Wow. And that's my drink. Yeah. And so I've enjoyed it, embraced it, and uh, and that's what I do. Brilliant, man. Brilliant. Yeah. Do you biohack at all? No. I want to yeah. do stem cells. I'd like to try that. Uh, yeah. I definitely want to try that, but... Uh, yeah, other than that, no. There's right. different things you can do to get started. So there's one company that has patches, mm -hmm. and they can put out. Some people put them on their dogs yeah. too, and it works really well. Really, that's a good way to get started. Oh, that's cool. There, so. there's one. I just somebody I followed on Twitter. Um, and so like I, I have not been sleeping well for. I mean, for a right. while. Just with everything going on, I just I lay in bed and my mind just is spinning and I can't fall asleep. And there was a biohacker that I followed, and, and he was talking about magnesium glycine, I believe, or uh -huh. uh, yep. uh, vitamin K2 and vitamin yep. D yep. all at the same time, and they both yep. like affect mm -hmm. each other. And he said it would help with sleep, and I started doing that. And immediately, like, I take that, and I can sleep. I don't wake up throughout the night. Wow. And I was like, this stuff works. I, I, I'll, give you, I'll give you another trick. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, I'll help you. Grab a piece of paper. Take five minutes. Push everyone away from you. And it, like, not physically yeah, push yeah. it, but mentally, give yourself space, go in a room, just write down everything on your mind. Mm -hmm. Get out. Yeah. Because something's upsetting you or bothering you or you're frustrated or you're concerned, mm -hmm. right? Fear is kicking in. Because what, what I tell my employees and people ask me, I say, get rid of the gadgets away from you. Mm -hmm. Because I had one guy who works with me, we had this conversation a few weeks ago. He's like, I'm not bent, I'm not sleeping well. I said, yeah, I could tell your production's on. What's, what's going on? And he's like, I don't know. I wake up, I look at Instagram, and, and I start scrolling in the middle of the night. I'm like, you got to stop that. Put it 30 feet, 30 yards, whatever. I don't know how big your place is. Put it in a bathroom next door. Mm -hmm. Get out of the room, whatever yeah. you have to. That's the thing. we don't, Talk about giving yourself space. So for you, it's write everything down in your mind. Just take five minutes. Try it for a day. Yeah. If you like it, try it for two days. You will start stacking. On the, mm. And guess what? It becomes addicting. And then you start journaling. Yeah, That's what I do. So I have a morning routine. I wake up, meditate, do a vinyasa, stretch out, okay? Mm. At night, I meditate. Uh, I first journal. I meditate, vinyasa, go right to bed. I do it religiously because mm. I want to take care of myself. Mm. So for you, especially I have kids and, and commitments, it's like... If you're tired, Cam is not the best version of himself yeah. tired. There's no way. No mm. one is. So how do you do it? Give yourself the space. Say, you know what? I'm going to start. I'm going to write down whatever is on my mind. Mm -hmm. And you look at it, and you'll laugh, you'll laugh at yourself. Like, That's stupid. Yeah. You'll be like, yeah, why am I concerned about it? Or you might be like, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to... I'm going to put that away. I'm going to tackle mm -hmm. that tomorrow. Yeah, but now it's recorded somewhere, so your brain's yes. not worried about your it. Yes, your subconscious is yes. getting it out. And that's what you need to do is get it out of your system. Yeah. And again, it's 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 taking time for yourself. Love that. Great tip, man. Yeah. 
Uh, I want to talk real briefly on your parenting. Uh, you know, you have yes. you have some kids. Yes, I do. And they're they're a little older now, right? Like yes, like they're in their twenties. Okay, yep. And a and a late teenager. Okay, so how have you instilled your, I guess, wealth building, or I mean, or have you your wealth building, your personal development? How have you instilled that into your kids? Like, what are some of the best practices there? So one of the things I was concerned with is I didn't really grow up with money. And so I didn't have the issues of where my kids were going to go as I started building wealth and, and had money. And I said, well, my goal was to always provide them a life I never had. Mm-hmm. You know, cars when they're 16 is a great house, great education, the best schools. I wanted that for them. And I was going to do whatever it takes to provide that. So now all of a sudden you get there and then it's like, okay, well, I don't want them to be spoiled. I don't want them to take things for granted. I want to be kind, good citizens. Mm-hmm. So what do I need to do? So a lot of it was teaching and training, but one of the things we did is I understand money. That's my expertise. And so I said, well, I'm going to put my kids on a budget once I get to a certain point. They're going to get cell phones at a certain age for safety purposes and communication. But then I decide I'm going to put them on a budget. So when I started with my oldest son, I gave him a few bucks every month. And it taught him the value of money because I said, this is allocated for gas, for spending, eating, whatever. You go through it, you got to wait till next month. Mm -hmm. So it taught them how to budget. It taught them about the value of the U.S. dollar. One thing I preach to my kids is, yeah, we might have a lot, but we never show off. We're humble. We, We respect people. We value people. We listen to them. And that's how, that's how we're going to live life. And so with my kids, and people say online, like, why don't you talk more about your success this way? Because I want to set that example. I want to be humble. Mm-hmm. I don't need to tell you how great I am. Let other people tell yeah. you who I am. But with my kids, it was the same example, is get on a budget, understand the value of the dollar, understand how, what the dollar really means and how, what that struggle is mm-hmm. to earn it. And so... When you understand the dollar and you can earn it, especially as a young man or woman growing up, that's that's incredible. Because that way, when you do start making money, you don't spend it foolishly. You're mm-hmm. smart. Yeah. You, you're conservative. You don't live above your means. And that's those are the lessons I, I teach my kids. I encourage everyone is put them on a budget, mm-hmm. okay? And, and keep that standard, adhere to it. So if you gave someone $100 a month, and it's day 23 of a 31-day month, and they have three bucks left, guess what? They'll figure it out. Yeah. yeah. And they what a always, good lesson for life. They always do. Yeah. 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 Beautiful, man. I love it. Uh, all right. I want to move on to the next segment of the show. It's called the three, two, one pivot. The idea of a pivot is your life is going one direction, mm-hmm. something changes it, and it goes another direction. So yes. I want to start with books. Yes. So three books that have changed the direction of your life. Um. I just read one that really changed me. It was called The Surrender Experiment I by Michael, Michael Singer. Singer. Yeah. A mentor of mine said, you have to read this book. And I loved it. Um, another one is, uh, it's by uh, Dr. Nicole Pereira. It's called uh, L- Love the Person You Are. It's something like that. I yeah. can't remember exact. Great book. It teaches you not only about the subconscious, but also teaches you about your inner child, mm-hmm. which is where I started you know, years ago in personal development is that inner child that felt emotionally abandoned, mm-hmm. that got triggered. How do I understand who he is and call him and, and, and make sure he's okay? Mm-hmm. And so that was a great book. And then, you know... There's thousands of business books I've read. I, there's one book I really enjoyed. It's complicated. I wouldn't recommend it, but it's so thick. It's called Mitsui. Hmm. And it was a family in Japan that built their empire. And it allowed me to really learn about business and, hmm. and building an empire and stuff. And I thought that was a really fascinating book. And obviously, there's just hundreds of books out yeah. there you can read. Yeah. Love it. Cool, so. man. All right, so who are uh, two people that you have encountered that have changed the direction of your life? Well, the one guy I mentioned who was the billionaire from New York, yeah. okay, I don't want to say his name, but he uh, he changed the trajectory of my life when he first said that to me. Um, and then, it's Cam, it's so tough because I've had so many mentors and coaches from around the world 
um, that have just taught me so many things about myself uh, that have, you know, I have a mentor named JP from Panama who Mm -hmm. changed me. Um, Dan Pena from Scotland is a guy that I'm friendly with. He's changed me. Um, Amelia Antonetti, who I currently work with, I mean, she's phenomenal. I, I have... I'm so blessed because I get to meet so many incredible people that touch commercial real estate. I mean, I got to uh, network with Sam Zell, mm. uh, just, inc- you know, um, Al Tobman from Detroit, mm. from Tobman Centers, the Simons. Um, I, I was dating a girl at Indiana, and, and her her grandfather was best friends with the Simons from Simon. Yeah. Ma- the malls. malls yeah. I got to eat lunch with them before a Pacers yeah. Bulls game in college. <laughs> so I got to meet them. So I just, you know, in, in my podcast, uh-huh. my podcast has allowed me, like, um, and we'll talk about charity yeah. with one of the guys um, is Anthony Scaramucci. Yeah. He was on my show. He created Impact for me. We became friends. Uh, Phil Helmuth, the poker mm-hmm. player, was on my show. He gave me a lot of good tips. Yeah. What I love about the podcast and meeting you guys is that. You're going to teach me. It doesn't matter how successful you are. It's your experiences and your knowledge and what's the gray matter between your ears that are going to impact me. And so it's such a tough question because I'd have to sit here for days to just, I'm so grateful. One of the things I do in the morning routine also is I'll send three texts every morning. Mm -hmm. So if you get a text from me, you know (laughs) why. And I just, a little note saying, you know what, Cam, really great meeting you. You really... You touched on this, and it really made me think, and I just want to let you know I'm really grateful for you. That's I so do cool. it every day. I do it three yeah. times, and even people I might not have talked to for like 10, 15, 20 years, mm-hmm. I'll do it. And it just it reconnects people. It also expresses how you feel and the appreciation you have. I could not be the man I am today without all these incredible, talented people that have helped me get there. I love that idea. Yeah. What is one quote that's changed your life or helped oh, guide it? I love that. Um, one of my fraternity brothers who passed away years ago, he used to say to me, tough times don't last, tough people do. Mm. I never forgot oh. that. I never forgot that because every time I go through a challenge or a tough moment or a deal's not working out or employee, mm-hmm. I just – I go – I bring that back off my mental shelf, and yeah. I'm like, okay, Ben, we'll get through this. Because my father used to say to me, he had another great quote, that if anyone, this is a great thing to, to hear, is this shall pass. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whenever you're going through a tough time, just go through, I want everyone to reflect back on a tough time they went through or a tough moment or someone was criticizing them. Mm-hmm. Look back a few moments later, this shall pass. Yeah. And if you have that in your head, you're like, all right, I'll get through this. And so tough times don't last, how people do. Love okay. it. Perfect. We're going to move into uh, the next part where we're going to talk about your past self, your present self, and your future self. But before we do, do we have the show sponsor? And oh, we do. We totally forgot about the sponsor. All right, <laughs> man. This episode, uh, it, we're going to dedicate 100% of the, pr- uh, the revenue from the ads directly toward a charity of your choosing. Yes. So where are we? Uh, I'm going to give you the uh, All right, where exact are we sending money? name. Um, so... My dear friend, Anthony Scaramucci, um, incredibly talented person. And it's some, it, what's interesting about this charity is both him and I are, are, have been inflicted by friends and colleagues. His general counsel just passed away of a brain tumor. And so mm. the braintumorfoundation.org is uh, something near and dear to Anthony Scaramucci and it is to me as well. And so um, it's something I think is a great cause for everyone to support and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, express it here on your show. Awesome. Um, We will definitely send the money for that. Well, today's show is sponsored by... Hey, quick story for you. About five years ago, I went to a real estate event where I met a handful of incredible investors. Two of them in particular, though, changed my life. Those two investors were Brian Murray, Ryan Murdoch. They're now partners with me at Open Door Capital, where we bought over a billion dollars worth of real estate. Not a bad ROI for an event, right? Now, why do I share that? 
because it's one of the most underutilized tools for real estate investors. Events. You can't put a price tag on the relationships you build, new business partners you meet, the knowledge you gain. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about Better Life's REI Summit uh, that I'm personally hosting on May 3rd through May 5th in Denver, Colorado. I'll be there along with a number of other speakers that you might recognize like Ken McElroy, David Green, AJ Osborne, Brian Murray, who I mentioned earlier, and more. The event's going to be the most actionable real estate event ever, uh, with sessions being structured on a how-to basis, so you can walk away with actionable steps that you can actually implement in your business ASAP. Whether you're a new investor or a seasoned investor, the dual-track sessions ensure that you'll be in sessions relevant to your business and experience. If you're interested in learning more, check out reisummit2024.com. That's reisummit2024.com. Ticket prices are increasing soon, so register ASAP to lock in the lowest rate while you can. All right, man. Next question. Love it. So let's let's talk about past you first. So if you could go back and talk to twenty year old Ben, what what would you tell him? What what advice would you give him? I would say work on yourself. Mm-hmm. Work on yourself, and that will allow you to decrease the learning curve and, and increase the trajectory of your life. Mm-hmm. Wow, beautiful. What is your number one rule for living a better life today? The number one rule for living a better life is be a great listener. Mm-hmm. Mm. That will carry you through life, and it will create great opportunities and great deep-rooted relationships. Mm-hmm. You know, you have two ears and one mouth. Yeah, Keep your mouth shut and just listen, and you will learn and grow, and you will attract what you want in life. Mm. That's great. Mm. So good. Love it. So you're a biohacker, so you might live for another 150 years. But I'm, I'm going to live to 150, <laughs> so if you guys want to join me, I'd love, <laughs> yeah. to, love, love, to, love to see you uh, as we're, we're walking on the yeah. beach somewhere. But uh, that, so the cool. goal is to live as long as possible. Love it. Well, someday, after you're 150, you're going to die, and yes. you're going to have a funeral. And people are going to get up and talk about you and, and talk about how great you are and and I, I love to think of this of like, what, what are people going to say at my funeral? And so what, what do you want people to say? I want people to say that uh, he was generous uh, with his time and, and resources. Um, I want people to say that, uh, that he changed my life, uh-huh. that he provided me opportunities to live the life that I want to design. Yeah. If I can have people say that about me, that's everything. Love it. It's not about money. It's not about how many deals I've done. It's, 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 you know, Cam, I have a stat in my company in my life is how many kids have I put through college of yeah. the employees that have worked awesome. at Alliance? And it's a tremendous amount. It's those little things that I look at that are the barometer for my success. And so when I'm, when I pass and, mm-hmm. And people were at my funeral. It's, it's how did I help serve them yeah. and create opportunities for them that changed their life, but not only that, their lineage lives, yeah. their DNA. And that's what I do for my employees is that it's not just about them. How does it impact their families and their future? Yeah. And that's what I want to be reflected at when, when people are at my funeral. love that. What, what do you want your kids to say about their dad? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, are you listening out there? <laughs> um, I want them to say that uh, he was caring. He gave us an incredible life of opportunities to make our lives better. Mm-hmm. But the ability to grow as people and become great parts of society and the lessons he learned and the work ethic and just the characteristics I've learned. And that's why when I'm on social media, I want to reflect that so mm-hmm. they can carry that with them and so they can watch my reels or videos and learn and have it be evergreen mm-hmm. for them. You know, it was originally about like, it would be great if these reels are great for my kids that they can watch 20 years and then their kids yeah. uh, and grandkids and great grandkids. And, and hopefully everyone out there can learn as well from those videos and reels I produce. And so for my kids, I just want them to know that, uh, that their father gave 120% in everything he did. Yeah. And that was great to people, cared, and was a good part of society. And and hopefully it's that legacy that I leave for them to learn and grow. Yeah. Awesome. So, 
Let's wrap things up, man. All right. What are you excited about? What's coming up in your life? I know you got a book coming out, right? Yeah. What well, else? A book and coming out in the future, but I have a new show that's dropping April 9th. It's Ben Reinberg. I own it. It's a TV show. It'll be streaming to a screen near you. And I'm really excited. The first season is on leverage. And it's about leverage of all aspects of life. Everyone can learn from it. Uh, it's quick. They're like 15-minute interviews. We have just incredible, talented people on the show from all walks of life. And it's great because I am going to be doing a tremendous amount of teaching and educating on the show. I will guarantee this. You will get something out of the show. We'll, we'll let you think. We'll let you. And it doesn't matter what business you're in. It's not commercial real estate focus. It's more about life and business mm-hmm. and the ability to help you grow and improve in whatever you want to do. And so the first season is about leverage, the power of leverage. You're going to learn about what it means to different people. You're going to learn about when is taking leverage too far. Yeah. And you're going to learn some great life lessons. I'm going to make you think. You will walk away from that episode thinking, and that's my job. And so that's what I'm really excited about. And I'm excited about the future. I have, I have a, a lady who we're grooming to take over my position at Alliance, which I'm excited about. So I'll be going into my next chapter and uh, just looking at different asset classes we're looking at. We're growing and uh, excited about the future. And I'm excited the personal brand's growing. And, uh, and the other thing I'm doing, Brand, is I'm speaking. So mm. I used to speak at college campuses and universities, and uh, now I'm speaking out in public more and more. And so I have a few speaking engagements um, from some big crowds, and so excited about that. That's and cool. And I'm looking forward to that. So That's, that's amazing. Awesome. And hey, what's the book called, and what's the show called? book's eventually going to be called I Own It, okay. and we're working on it. And so the show is uh, Ben Reinberg hyphen I Own It, and it's the first season. It's leverage mm-hmm. of the new TV show. So. Awesome, man. Yeah. Um, so you're obviously an incredible educator. I could have sat here for the next five hours and listened to you. Um, but uh, for people that just want to learn more about you and, and hear you uh, speak or just even watch your Instagram reels, where where can they find you at? The best way to connect with me is go to benreinberg.com. Okay. And you can go to my company, Alliance CGC, charliegeorgecharlie.com, Alliance CGC. BenReinberg.com is great because not only does it talk about me, but it can connect you to all my social media links. Obviously, on Instagram, if you have a lot of Instagram followers here, it's at the real Ben Reinberg. I'm on TikTok, Facebook. Um, you know, I've been on LinkedIn for years. Mm-hmm. And you were OG uh, LinkedIn. I was an OG, OG LinkedIn, LinkedIn <laughs> guy. When they first started, I was on it. And uh, Jeff has done an incredible job with that platform and great business platform. So I'm on all the platforms. You can find me. You can Google me, but BenReinberg.com is a great way. And then on all the uh, podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, you can go to Ben Reinberg hyphen I, I own it. Hi, ben Reinberg hyphen I own it, and that will allow you to listen to past episodes. We've had incredible guests from around the world. Um, totally have impacted me. And uh, and the new show is more focused on leverage, and so that will be coming out soon. And if you follow me, you'll be able to figure out where the new show is and all the streaming services we're on. So, All right, man. Uh, hey, appreciate right. you. This is amazing. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks yeah, for having thanks me. Thanks so much. Right. Appreciate it. Three-way fist bump. Look at that. Oh. Boom. And that, my people, is the show. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed uh, the insights from the episode. And hey, before you go, if you enjoyed this episode or you enjoy the show in general, please consider leaving us a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. We really do value your feedback, and we read your comments to make future decisions about topics and guests and everything else. Plus, it helps us reach more people the more reviews we have. And last but not least, please head over to social media and consider that are friending, following, subscribing, and all that stuff uh, to both Better Life, at Better Life over on Instagram, and my own personal, at Beardy Brandon for more. That's Beardy with a Y at the end of it, Beard with a Y, Brandon on you know YouTube, Instagram, everywhere else. Thanks again for listening. I am honored that you would bring me along on your journey to building wealth without losing your soul. This show has been a production of the Better Life Tribe, copyright 2024. Our producer is Kevin Leahy with Podcast Point Man. Our videographer and uh, all-around talented video guy, Carson Smith. My co-host is the amazing Cam Cathcart with DealFlowRealEstate.com. 
And finally, you know, this show has been all about living a better life. But if you want my spiritual answer to what it takes to live not only a better life, but the best life, head over to abetterlife.com forward slash best life. I got a 13 minute special video for you there. For the Better Life Tribe, my name is Brandon Turner, signing off.